the Coach Rob Podcast. Answering questions and eliminating frustrations about health, wellness, and performance since 1987. Welcome to the Coach Rob Podcast. I'm your host, Toolman Dan. Coach Rob Beams, how are we doing today? Good afternoon, my man. Always good to see you. It seems like two weeks has been uh, three months. Seems like forever ago. It does, man. With the time flies when you're having fun. Uh, this one's going to be good today. This one is what the people have been asking for, man. We left them. We left them on the cliffhanger with with Coach with Who is Coach Rob Part One. We're going to do Who is Coach Rob Part Two today, mm. and we'll see if we even finish a Part Two, Coach. Maybe <laughs> there will be a Part Three. I don't know. Your life is so interesting and intriguing. The programs are second to none. I mean, we could talk about you literally every week. No, I, I let's not do that and say we did. <laughs> um, but uh, I do want to say to everybody who was kind enough to leave a message, whether it was on YouTube or on a DM, thank you so much. I mean, this is not a very comfortable subject for me to talk about, uh, but you were the first person that said you wanted to do something like this. And I think that's why, because it's, you know, an unfamiliar experience. Uh, the more you do something, the more comfortable you get with it, whether it's teaching a subject or whatever. So um, yeah, as we say, and we said it even in our last show as well, we we like to pride ourselves that this is the people's podcast and it we got enough requests that came in and you kept pushing and pushing. So here it is. And I'm honored to do it. It's a little embarrassing, but I'm honored to do it. And the fact that people find it, you know, both insightful and Hopefully, it helps them get a better idea of how we think as a as a company. Um, that that's to me what's most important because we really, really. I, I did a podcast earlier this week, and if somebody else has seen it, I apologize. It's repetitive, but my goal is to go to bed every night, making the world a little better than it was when I woke up. Whatever that looks like, if it's answering a frustration, if it's solving a problem, that that's what makes it getting out of bed, you and I refer to it as a coach client. We refer to this as volition. What gets you out of bed? What motivates you? So yeah. I'm happy to be here and tad bit embarrassed to do it. But hey, if that's what the people want, that's what we'll give them. I don't care if you're embarrassed, but are you <laughs> scared like you were in part one? Because before we did part one, you were very scared uh, that because uh, you've never talked about this kind of stuff. So you didn't know what rabbit holes I was going to lead you down. But I think we did pretty good on part one. Are you less scared today for part two than you were part one? I, I'm less afraid, but I'm hoping that you're not going to be a little bit smart aleck and, and blindside <laughs> me here. So I put some trust in No, I all kidding aside. Um, yeah, it's an uncomfortable environment. I don't like talking about myself um, only because it. I don't want to give the impression that we're trying to be boastful about anything. But like a lot of people have said, where where did you come from? How did you get here? Why do you feel the way you do? Where do you get your information from, your opinions? And I thought that's a legitimate question. And I think the listeners deserve the background on that. So that was why I, I caved into it. I know you've been pushing for it, but then with both what the, what the audience has been asking for and what you've put together, I'm willing to be as vulnerable as necessary, especially if it creates clarity for, for our listeners, for sure. Yeah. Well, in part one, we covered just a quick recap. We kind of covered your history when you were a, when you were a, a little wee young coach rob uh you know how you kind of became what you are today as, as far as uh, the, being at the olympic training center and working with different riders uh some of the, the elite athletes like ryan dungy adam Cinturillo, some guys like that you know when they were younger you worked with we kind of talked about some of your experiences that you had with those clients and uh you know, it, it really grew into something more, and and that's the company that you've built today. So I want to kind of cover uh, the company that you've built, the the empire I call it, uh, <laughs> Complete Racing Solutions, um, which is a is kind of under the umbrella of your you know of your total business, right? Because you don't just do racing stuff; you do triathlon stuff, uh, a bunch of individual athletic sports, um, but Complete Racing Solutions is is a big one for you. And yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about that specifically here in part two. Um, let's get into it. Complete Racing Solutions is is uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It is a, it's a racing solution for racers and not only racers. 
it is uh, it's for the everyday weekend warrior too, and I, and I want to I want to kind of dive into that as well because I think a lot of people uh, you know think that wow man I don't race so I don't I don't need help I don't need a coach I don't need supplements I don't need energy fuel I don't they don't need any direction but they're tired of feeling like crap and they really do need some direction so whether you're a you know you're a, an amateur racer a pro racer or just an everyday uh, you know vet guy or just kid that wants to ride there's a there's there's a place in your program for everybody absolutely and i kind of want to get into that but um let's get into to complete racing solutions um and and what you offer there's there's programs products let's get into the products portion of it um you've got you you have a lot of different products from cookbooks to supplements to drinks so and and i want to let you have the floor and explain why you came out with these products if we if we look at the ten thousand foot view, our our parent company is Athletic Endurance Masters Inc. And then we have four verticals of business. We have a weight loss and general fitness division. We have a speed and agility, which is ball and stick sports. And then we have an endurance division. And then we have a motorsports division. And when we when we as a company, as we sat down and started working with families. What we recognized was that the parents were very frustrated. The older vet riders were very frustrated because they had to go to the gym and get a strength and conditioning coach. Then they had to go find a massage therapist. Then they had to go find a nutritionist. Then they found a sports psychologist that kind of knew moto, but really didn't understand the nutrition. You see where there's a lot of yin and yanging going on. When you go to the track and you go and you get a riding coach, it's very sport specific. Um, I think most people are aware of the fact that our largest division is our endurance division. And I've, I've taught all around the world, everything relevant to swimming, biking, running, lifting, and all that goes into it. If you look at the void of knowledge that's here in our industry of moto and off-road racing, there just is a, a, a tremendous amount of misinformation that's out there because when an ex-pro retires and he decides that he's going to go become a trainer, they start to take on more, you know, verticals that they probably shouldn't, just like I should never be anybody's professional mechanic, as I always tease you, just because I read a manual. So when we put the program together, it really was just listening to the end users. And I want you to think about this without sounding crass in any way. Stop and think about, it doesn't matter of age, it doesn't matter of proficiency, doesn't matter what sport of those four verticals we spoke about. When I say sport, when we say ball and sticks, that would be lacrosse, football, soccer, Anything that involves acceleration, deceleration, pivot, and reacceleration, motorsports, anything with a motor. And when you look at the endurance division, that'd be triathletes, cyclists, runners, gravel bike, the whole nine yards. What is it that all of those verticals have in, in common? Well, if you breathe oxygen and you have warm blood going through your body, you're pretty much have the same needs, wants, and desires that everybody else does. It's where are you at and where do you want to go and how do you want to get there? Some people are really here, you know, they're down here and they want to get way up here and they're willing to take shortcuts. I'm not your coach. I'm, I'm not the least bit interested in trying to get somebody on a cheater program. What I am interested in, and by the way, I don't want that to sound like a goody two shoes. The reason why that's not my platform is because when you cheat 99.99% .99 of the time, you have to self-sacrifice your human body to be able to cheat, to get those immediate results. It doesn't matter whatever subject that you want to bring up. I can show you that if you cheat the system, unfortunately, your body will pay the ultimate price. Dan, you and I have talked about it here in our previous pods together. We had a, a young lady who her entire image was about her whole identity, rather, was all about her image. And she came to us and she had, was very transparent that she was shooting up HGH and she was taking some testosterone. So she looked really, really lean, but she wasn't doing the work that she liked to convey on social media that she was actually doing. She wasn't. It was what we call posturing, right? Posing. Like, it's like the it's like this big Ozempic uh, push right now. Everybody's taking Ozempic to lose weight when it is terrible for you. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you go back to any weight loss product, you can go back, you know, I'm going to go back to the early 80s. When you have a lot of these products, if you go and you look at the key ingredient, regardless of what the title and the branding name is, if you go and look at it, the lion's share of those are just going to be exorbitant amounts of stimulants. 
let's say caffeine. There, a lot of them got away from the caffeine because people were picking up on it and they were going down the road, the road and the route of natural herbs that have a stimulating effect. And the reason why the weight loss companies are able to make so much money is they have very, very little cost in the product because it's pretty much a, a cheap stimulant, but a stimulant will suppress appetite. I mean, that's literally the weight loss industry. Anything that you consume that says, hey, we're going to suppress your appetite, they're using a cheap stimulant. The natural way to suppress appetite, and I shouldn't even use the word suppress, but maybe satisfy appetite, is just eat protein and fat. But do you see the difference that requires you cooking something and actually sitting down and consuming it slowly? But I can get you the same effect, but I don't want you to have the mindset that you've got to starve yourself to lose weight because that's really just dehydration. There's, you see the difference here? Yeah. Every vertical of business that we have, if you breathe oxygen and you have warm blood in your body, getting from where you're at to where you want to go, it's going to take a po- it's going to take a process and a system. Well, the good news is, doesn't matter if you're 10, 20, 40, 60, 90 years old, the process is the same. What we have to what we have to adjust is what's the volume of training, what's the intensity of training, what's the work rest ratio. You see how that's completely customized. And that's the part that most people don't want to pay attention to. We've gotten into a lot of trouble at a collegiate level. Um, You can imagine a lot of the collegiate programs that are out there. Your daughter, when she gets to college, is perceived as a cog in the wheel for the program. They could give two shits if they tear your daughter's shoulders up and they suppress her immune system and they wear her out till she has adrenal fatigue. Because in four years, she's out. Another group of kids comes in. It just makes the program look good at the expense of your daughter. We, I I would say probably on an annual basis, we probably do eight to 10 collegiate programs, runners, swimmers, soccer players, football players, lacrosse, where the program itself is ruining the athlete and the parent recognizes it and says, hey, can you help us keep our child from getting overworked by a system? Now, it's a very finite line. If your daughter goes to school full scholarship for swimming, and all of a sudden, you kind of push back a little bit. What's the what's the threat they're going to give you? We're going to pull your scholarship, right? And then the parents freak out because school is expensive. That's why I always say I will never put your health behind performance. I'll always put your health before performance. Now, with that being said, I have been fired many, many times because of that. You get a parent that says, look, I hired you to smash my little boy, girl, it, I need them to be absolutely worked hard so we can get to that college level so we can get a scholarship. It's A lot of times it's not that the athlete needs more. And when I say athlete, let's take a pre-college, let's take out of college, let's take a midlife, let's take at the end of our athletic career. None of us need to get smashed. There's, a, there's that fine line between working hard enough to get adaptation, but not to the point that it starts to jeopardize your health. And I think that's the part that people have a tendency to overlook. So when you come back to your original question, like what's the genesis behind the companies? Well, the companies are all geared around making sure that we build a foundation of health first, implement performance protocols, and then evaluate the progress that we're making. And the more committed you are to the program, and when I say committed, you'll eat and sleep enough, give the body what it needs from the inside out, you will progress quicker than if you don't. And Dan, you wouldn't believe how much pushback I get on that. Stop and think about it. You want me to build you a two-story house, but you only bring enough materials for one story, and then you get pissed that I can't build you a two-story. This is an example we've used previously together. Well, then why do you think you can do that with a human body? If I starve it, if I dehydrate it, I meet a scale, weight, I meet a number, but you expect the body to rebuild itself. That's what puts you on a fast track to being unhealthy and ultimately diseased with Epstein-Barr, Addison's. And the crazy part is we're supposed to be the smartest species alive and we have blood results that show you when you're out of balance and yet you have people, excuse me, advocating intermittent fasting. You think about this, Dan. I was teasing with our staff about this a couple weeks ago. If you go back, like we were talking about, standing the, the... the test of time and all the different fads that have come and gone. Think about when people said to you, eating three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's all you need to do. And then what was the next thing that came around? Eat smaller meals, but just eat more of them, right? So now you're you're being encouraged to eat three, five times a day, smaller portion, 
It's going to get less of an insulin spike. And that was the healthy thing. Three times a day, no longer healthy. Five to six times a day. That's the golden gem right there. And now we're being told that if we eat once a day, or if we eat once every three days, that that's now the new healthy. I'm completely, I have to laugh out loud. Now, again, don't send any snide comments below or leave snide comments below or send me nasty DMs going, well, you wouldn't believe how intermittent fasting has changed my life. I, I understand. I've seen it. I've studied it. I understand what the body will do, but there's a distinct difference between thriving and surviving. And I just think it's interesting. Three times a day. No, not right. Five times a day. Getting better. No, let's just go to once a day or once every three days. Yeah. And that's healthy. Like, how does the body... How does the listeners expect the body to rejuvenate itself when you're starving it? I that's, just don't get it. I don't. That's get what's it. so unique about your program. It's it's, and and I, and I I would tell anybody this: like if you're looking for an immediate result tomorrow, the, your program is not for them. Mm -hmm. Your program is for the long haul it, to, to make sure that you're the best athlete long term, uh, and, and you're doing it right where you're going to be healthy. You know, not only through you, the, the sport that you're competing in, but after in life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the biggest difference because you see a lot of these other, you know, quote unquote coaches and trainers out there that they just, they smash their, their people and these kids and, and young athletes are sick all the time mm -hmm. uh, because of it, but yet they just don't get back to, to Billy basics. That's, and that's right. really what it is, right? That's right. Well, and you can add another dynamic to that. And obviously, you and I, we love moto. If you go back and you look at the kids that were killing it on 50s and 65s, how many of those same athletes are killing it today in the pro ranks? Now, I can give you four specific riders that'll poke a hole in my theory, just off the top of my head, right? James Stewart, Ricky Carmichael, Michael Lessie. Maybe Lessie didn't have the professional career but that's for different reasons. Like he never learned to come through a pack. So when he went pro, if he started fifth, he stayed fifth because yeah. he only knew how to lead. He never knew, learned how to go through the pack. That's a different story for another day. But you can literally count on one hand how many people stamped it in the, in the small bike class and are now making millions of dollars as, as a professional. Now, again, I'm not here to, to, to treat anybody disrespectfully, but it's very hard for me to swallow the pill when you see a pattern, you see the pattern has a negative outcome, and yet you still continue to pursue a pattern that has a negative outcome. I mean, 20 years ago, we could chalk it up to the lack of knowledge. Couldn't get access to the library. Maybe the library that you had didn't have the books that you needed or you maybe even were looking for. What's the excuse now with internet? It's the exact opposite. You have such a proliferation of misinformation that's being put out there that the end user is like, I don't know who to believe. I don't know what's what works and what doesn't. Just like the girl that we picked up who her entire social media platform, she was making great money selling an image that was completely false. Now, I have a problem with that from a morality standpoint because to me, I'm lying to you. To me, that's a bait and switch. I tell all my clients, if you ever came to me and said, hey, I've been diagnosed, diagnosed with Epstein-Barr, I'd be gutted. This is why we're putting together a program and there's some checks and balances and I'm happy to talk about it here today if you have time to go over it. But if I ever ruin somebody's health, it would never be intentionally. And this is why we're making a guarantee that if we ever do that, we will give the end user 100% of their money back. But there's a catch. And the catch is, how do I know that you're doing what I asked and not doing more? So if I ask for 30 minutes of exercise and you do 90, that's three times more than I asked for. It doesn't mean the program didn't work. That was just because you chose to do something different. You see the difference? Yeah. And that's where we're trying to make a difference with our coaching network by saying, hey, look, we don't only just want to be a part of your health. We want to be part of your performance. But let's lay out a legitimate, a legitimate plan of how long does it take for us to get for you to be able to win World Vets, Mammoth, Loretta's, Daytona, whatever your, your it is. But here's the difference. We have the ability to show... If I work, Dan, we've done this. I've worked with you for a year. I can show you that when you dialed in your nutrition and you dialed in your hydration, we could see a percentage of improvement that far superseded when you were a little bit more inconsistent with the recovery elements. Daughter got sick, wife got sick, had traveling, 
had a job change. That's called life. Yep. But but we were able to illustrate how your percentage of improvement wasn't as consistent. And you know, let's say you were improving by one and a half to two percent, then all of a sudden it falls down to a half a percentage point. Well, why was there that delta of change? Well, because you weren't able to recover. You see, it's I, I won't say that success is guaranteed because nothing's guaranteed, but success is also not accidental. And so that's the big casting net that we've put out. Like, for example, in our general fitness and uh, weight loss division, we do it exactly the opposite that you see on Biggest Loser, right? They're trying to starve them and they're going high intensity. And if you've ever studied the Biggest Loser history, every single person that has ever won the Biggest Loser has put the weight back on. Every single person. And that's because that system is not sustainable. Now, it makes for great television and it sells a lot of advertising dollars. But it, and it made that lady Julian and a couple of those trainers extremely wealthy individuals because what did they do? They went out and started selling a platform. Yep. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. And, and I say that very humbly because I've seen people come across our front door that have tried everything that's been sold on TV and it's not sustainable. It doesn't work. And it's my job to help them understand why it didn't work because the end user thinks it's their fault. And that's what a lot of the platforms like to say. Dan, you didn't get the results that this guy did, so it must be you. But what they don't tell you is that this guy cheated. This guy's on synthetic HGH and testosterone. This, and I see it all the time. And um, so when you come back to the, the original question, like what's the genesis behind it? What's the vision? Well, if you breathe oxygen and if you have warm blood going through your body, physiology is applied to everybody the same way. We need oxygen, food, and water. We need sleep to recover. Now, how you take those pieces of the puzzle, like we could have, you know, my wife's a professional, you know, artist. You could take five cans of paint and you can mix a lot of different paints together. You get a lot of different colors and a lot of different outcomes. And that's essentially what we do is we take somebody where they're at. We want to find out what they want to accomplish. And then we build a a blueprint. And I always try to be very honest with them. What you want to do may take longer than you want to give it. I may not be your cup of tea. I need 18 to 24 months. Not because I'm dragging it out, but you've got some pretty lofty goals. Yeah. We had one this week with somebody had, um, unfortunately, you'll appreciate this, Dan. They went to an off-road race and they didn't have goggles set up with roll-offs. So they tried to race with tear-offs and water got in between the, the tear-offs. They misjudged and they it was an off-road race. He came around a corner and caught a tree. And the tree limb caught the front of the the chromium process and literally ripped his entire shoulder out. And, but unfortunately he didn't do physical therapy correctly. So he's got a ton of scar tissue in there. So he has very, very limited range of motion. And as we always say, the second injury is a byproduct of not recovering from the first one. So he went out and tried to race again and didn't have the balance and the coordination. Hit another tree. Um, This one he actually hit, shouldered it straight on and completely blew his shoulder out again. And so he's like, I want to get back to the elite level of GNCC racing. And I'm like, well, first thing we have to do is get the mobility back in your shoulder. Not something that somebody wants to hear. They want to talk about, you know, sprint speed and endurance and lactate tolerance and all that. How about just being able to take your hand and over your arm, you know, your arm over your head and get at least 50% of your normal range of motion and then ultimately 60, 70, 80. And then let's talk about your balance back on the bike. So that's kind of the mantra that I like people to go away with. We start at a very, you know, minimal level and we get as big and broad as you want to go as long as you can stay the course. So hopefully that makes uh, makes it pretty clear as to what our approach is. No, it does. And it it brings clarity to what what the program is all about, right? Whether whether or not you're 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 an athlete in triathlon or if you're an athlete in motorsports, it's really all the same, right? It's starting with the basics. It's starting with what your basic needs are and, and also looking at your goal and putting a program together. So everybody's program is built for them. It's not just a general program. Mm-hmm. You're watching everybody's, you know, biometrics through the Garmin uh, devices, uh, you know, conference calls with, with your team. Um, it, it's very specific. So I think that that's what it, where your program differs from a lot, right? Well, that's that's our ultimate goal, and what we've done is we try to we try to make different tiers be available. I want to make sure that everybody understands. I'm not interested in a cash grab. Um, there's plenty, you know. I've I've gone out of my way to put as many resources out there as I possibly can. If you go to any of our websites, 
Um, if, if you go to our resource page, there's a multitude of, of resources that are available. If you go to any of our YouTube videos, if you go below this video today, you go to the description box, click on the resource page, they're all there. Um, I'm not interested in a cash grab. What I'm interested in is, is fixing and eliminating people's frustrations, answering questions. Now, when somebody wants to get onto a program, I hope that they'll give us a chance. Um, we have membership, which is, you know, starts at $15 a month. And then we have customized programs that go, and I don't mind saying publicly, they go to $5,000 a month at a professional level. Um, but with that comes incrementally different levels of attention to detail, analysis, things that are included. Um, the, the most important part is there's the, every service that we provide is only geared towards the individual. And what I mean by that is like, I never wanted to start a sports drink company, but I couldn't find a sports drink that was out there that the molecule of carbohydrate, the electrolyte, the electrolyte profile wasn't matching to how the product was being utilized. If you look at motocross amateur wise, amateur races are six to eight minutes as qualifiers and longest race is 20 minutes at nationals. If you're using a product that is what we call a slow burning carbohydrate, the athlete could think it's him or her and their fitness when it's actually not getting enough calories. So think about it, Dan, you build a race motor. Let's go back. Let's just assume we have carburetors and cylinders. You have this big bore cylinder, but you've got a, a carburetor that's got the air fuel mixture. That tube is pinched. So the, 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 the piston has its capabilities, but it's not getting enough of what it needs to produce power. Is that a fitness issue? No, that's a fueling issue. So then you come to the why we created energy fuel. Well, when you have somebody that's doing a high intensity workout or race, and they're using a fuel source that delivers the fuel too slowly, they think it's a fitness issue. So they train harder when that's not the source of the problem. The other thing, and this is something that I cannot believe is going on. I believe that this is almost fraudulent. A lot of these so-called sports strengths that are out there, and it's interesting, sports strength, you're noticing that they're promoting a zero calorie. Stop and think about this. And, and I'm not talking about the big companies that are in what we call RTDs. I'm not talking about the ones where you go to the grocery store and you see the bottles that you can just open them up and drink them. And they've got new categories, right? They've, they had yeah. the original, then they had the light, and now they have the zero. I'm not even talking about those guys. I'm talking about the companies that sell it in a powder, powder form. I had a gentleman who was kind enough. He was pretty aggressive, but he was kind. And he said, why is your product so expensive? Now, I thought that was interesting because obviously we're a business. We did a lot of due diligence to figure out what the market threshold was at. But I wasn't willing to create a cheap product only at a retail level. I wanted to build a product based on the characteristics of what it would provide. And then we'll see what we can do to make it as economical as possible. So here's where I was going with the illustration. This guy called me up. And he said, why is your energy fuel $80 for 30 servings? And we divided that up just under $3 for a bottle of, of energy fuel, 300 calories, keywords, calories. And he was there, was, there was a company that's out there that's selling a product. And he said, hey, I'm using this product. It's half of what yours is. And I said, yeah, good point. Look at the calorie content. The calorie content was next to nothing. So what they're doing is they're selling a sports drink, which is really an electrolyte powder. And then they're saying, well, you, they, they're selling it as no sugar, low calorie, but yet you need calories when you exercise. So you're paying for a drink because there's a, some powerful marketing behind it. And it's not giving you and delivering what you need when you exercise. Sugar, calories, electrolytes, muscle contraction, and the ability to absorb water. So... I'll make this story very, very short. What we did was I said, okay, look, take your sports drink that you're currently using that has close to no calories. You need 300 calories an hour. So let's just, and we, we Googled it together. We went out, we took a, a very popular gel, you know, the energy gels, those little sagittals that you can yeah. pull off and squeeze down. He would have needed to get two of those at approximately $2.50 a piece. So now you're $5 for calories plus his sports drink that he was buying from someone else. That was about $1.75 a bottle, about a dollar less than ours. But when he had to add calories into it, he's now at $6.75. And it didn't even have the same electrolyte profile that it needs to for muscle contraction. You see why I have such an ethical problem with this? 
Yeah. There's companies out there selling a product that has inferior electrolytes that aren't enough to meet muscle contraction needs with no calories selling it as an energy drink, sports drink. And then the athletes are going out there and shopping it on price instead of what it does. And that's why I want to get on every platform I can. Your sports drink needs to have electrolytes and calories. And your ideal number is 300 calories per hour. If you go above that, research has illustrated that your stomach can't digest and assimilate more than 300 calories an hour. So is it any surprise that our three formulations sit anywhere between 272 and 305 calories? And then you go another step of the way, you've got to look at as you bring the heart rate up, the complexity of the molecule has to come down. And then we take it a step further. Dan, we know that when you're when that gate's getting ready to drop, you need to have incredible mental focus. So we put a little bit of caffeine in for mental focus. It's been proven. Caffeine helps with mental focus. Dan's heart rate's going to be extremely elevated because he's going to sprint for six minutes. So the production of lactic acid is going to go through the roof. So we put a lactic acid buffer in our sports drink because we know you're going to need it, whether or not you know you bought that with it or not. So the goal is, if the body's going to be going short and fast and highly intense, make sure the carbohydrates are easily convertible and you've got a lactic acid buffer providing enough electrolytes for muscle contraction. And then we, we stagger that. One product formulation is for an hour or less. One is for literally one hour to three hours. And the third formulation is for three hours and above. Because when you go do a three-hour bike ride, your heart rate's going to be much lower than when you're sprinting a six, six lapper at the racetrack. If yeah. you're a runner, you're running, you know, you're running quarter repeats, you're at a higher intensity than you're going to go run your marathon. So do you see what we're trying to get at here is the market wasn't producing what the end user needed, especially when you get into the power of marketing dollars. I just am blown away that people can get away as a company marketing a sports drink with something that has no calories. And the reason why they don't have any calories is because that's where the expense comes in, but they've mind warped and manipulated the Hey, what's a sports drink anymore? It's people are getting away with selling a sports drink that has no calories. That's like saying that you're going to sell gasoline at the gas pump, but they're not putting actual, you know, gasoline in the pump. Yeah. You're paying for it, but you're not getting what you pay for. And that's the difference, right? That's the difference of these these companies know this, coach. They mm-hmm. they know that this is this is not, like I said, it's not rocket science. They know it, but they're using their advertising. Yep. to their their benefit and and really producing a product that is less expensive so it's it's more attractive to the end user couple that with the marketing and and you got this 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 product right that yep. is very well known there's a few of them out there but yeah when you get back to the science of it mm-hmm. like like you do and tie it all together i think it, it starts to make sense to people like Oh man, you know, this is the stuff that I need because this this was put together using science, not just wanting to grab money and and market. You know, well, and, and that's why we we don't want to sound like a textbook cliche, but that's why we call it the science of performance. Yep. Our sports drink was built around the scientific needs of the human body, whether you're walking around the block or you're racing at a high level. Same thing with our supplements. You have to have a, a, a doctor's license to be able to sell our supplements. I'm the first one to tell you they're not cheap. But what I will promise you is it's what we call the efficacy of the product. If you buy our whey protein, it's going to be 100% whey protein, no fillers, no artificial colors. If you buy our omega feet or omega three fish oils, it's 100% fish oil. It's there are no fillers. There's no garbage in it. Again, it's not about peddling products. It's the idea. Of and you guys have heard me say this publicly, I own a supplement company and I don't even want people to take supplements unless we can deem them necessary. We did it with you, Dan. Hey, yeah. you're burning 4,800 calories a day. What can we do in your daily schedule so that you can eat enough fruits and vegetables and lean protein to bridge 48 to 5,000 calories a day? If you can't get it with food, then sure, let's look at smoothies and let's look at whey protein shakes and things like that. But the whey protein shakes can never be a meal replacement. Never. It's hence the, that's why they're called supplements, right? You're supposed to supplement regular eating. Now we're all, we all live in the, in the real world. A lot of times we're busy. A consumable shake or smoothie is easier. And that was the genesis behind me putting my five cookbooks together on Amazon. Because the idea is, okay, great. 
I understand that I need to eat real food. What food should I eat? All right, so I understand, Rob, we go in the grocery store, we shop the perimeter. All right, so now I'm in the grocery store. I don't know what to buy. And then if I do buy it, I'm not quite sure how to combine it. Well, I just got together and said, all right, let's spend a couple months and let's let's think about all the different ways that we can combine and create smoothies. So we have a smoothie cookbook. Uh, if you're going to go to the grocery store, people are like, hey, what should I purchase? Well, instead of thinking about what to purchase, answer the question, how many calories do you need? What do you like to eat? What do the items provide you in the way of calories? You see how we we're going to reverse engineer? If I know, Dan, you're burning 5,000 calories a day because you're so tall and you're broad shouldered, right? As you put on more lean muscle mass, your calorie demands go up. People forget that. They're super pumped that they're dropping body fat. But now their calorie burn rate is going to go up because fat doesn't burn calories, but muscles burn calories. So I've seen people come in, they're they're used to a certain calorie burn rate. They put five or six pounds of muscle on. They forgot that they've got to take on more calories. They have to take on more water. They have to take on more electrolytes because the more muscle contraction, the quicker you deplete electrolytes. Now come full circle. Hey, Rob, what should I eat? Let me rephrase the question. How many calories do you need? All right. All right, I need 5,000 calories in your case, Dan. Okay, well, what do you like to eat? So now we, I take a list of everything that you and we require, we don't require it, but we request it. Just keep up with my fitness pal by Under Armour. Just go with the free version. Just plug your, plug your food items in. Get a ballpark. Because what you're essentially doing is showing me what is it that you normally like to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What do you like to snack on? Maybe we keep some. Maybe we get rid of others. The ones that we keep, we might add more volume, and then maybe we come up with some new portfolio ideas. Now we're getting back to the idea of what do I need to pick up at the grocery store? What is it you want to eat and snack on? How many calories does it yield versus what you're burning? Now you're guaranteed to sleep better, perform better athletically, and be healthier overall. Does it take a little bit of work? Just a smidgen. And that's why we put all these resources together. If you wear the Garmin, you're going to be able to help me answer how do we, how many calories do we need? I've been very vocal about the idea that when we were approached by Amazon, I wasn't interested in making $5 on a watch. The only thing that I've asked is, would you please give our end user the best price that they can? So we started an Amazon store. You guys can see it in the description box below. I'm not interested in making $5 on a, a Garmin scale. What I am interested in is the end user having all of the resources that he or she needs to make their life easier. If I have a digital scale and I can empty my bladder, step on it, the scale reads the bottom of my feet, it takes my body weight and plugs it into my watch, I don't have to get in there and manually do it. Is it physically difficult to do it? No. It's not physically difficult to brush our teeth every day, but sometimes it's an inconvenience, right? Yeah. That's all I'm trying to do is say, okay, we know that we need to get your body weight morning and evening. Well, what device is going to make that easier? A Garmin digital scale. So where do I find it, Rob? Go to our Amazon store. All right, so now I know how many calories I need to burn because I bought my Garmin. I'm looking at my scale weight every day. Well, how how do I, what do you suggest for combining foods? Let's look at your MyFitnessPal. By the way, you don't need me to, to walk you through this. Just take this video and walk it backwards. Garmin tells you how many calories you need. You keep track of your MyFitnessPal so it shows you what food items you like and what kind of calorie density. If it comes in a bag, a box, or a can, Try to get rid of it. See where we go here? If you go into the perimeter of the store, you're pretty much going to remove things that have preservatives. And the reason why we're trying to avoid cans, bags, and boxes is because it's processed carbohydrates full of preservatives that your body can't break down. So now what we've been able to do is, Dan, you went in, you filled in my fitness pal. Then you get to look back and just run it through the very simple litmus test. If it comes in a bag, a bar, or excuse me, if it comes in a bag, a box, or any type of a can, just try to get it out of your diet. I didn't slap you on the hand. I'm just saying yep. it has preservatives. You probably can't pronounce them, which means you can't digest them. And if you can't digest them, it's going to cause other issues. So guess what? You are now your own nutritionalist because you know how much you need, you know what you like, you see the calorie density, and you're just trying to remove preservatives. Now you can go out to Amazon and you can get our cookbooks and our smoothies. And you go, oh, here he is peddling products. No. It's just a way for you to say, okay, I'm over here picking up all these fruits. How would I combine them to make a very tasty smoothie? Well, here you go. Here's some suggestions. I think the cookbooks yep. are like $15.
And there's so, and the, the cool thing is is the all the food in the cookbooks is good. I, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm a little bit picky because I and I've been on other like you know programs you know when I was younger where they give you a sheet and you can only eat this. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, it ain't good. <laughs> no, it's not good no. food. So no. At least with the cookbooks, you know, you could, it, it, it's got, they do have good food. But the cool thing is, Coach, is a lot, we're all busy. A lot of mm-hmm. us are busy, right? And we don't want, and we, and we don't have, we don't have time. And quite frankly, we probably don't want to have to search multiple different spots for different things, right? Yep. Where a complete racing solution, you offer a true solution for everything, whether it's training program, whether it's supplements, whether it's sports drinks, whether it's, you know, cookbooks and, and what to eat and the nutrition, you offer it all. So you don't have to be looking in different places for the information because you have it all. And I think that that is worth its weight in gold. Well, that's our goal. That's always been our ultimate goal is to, I'm going to steal a line from the late Robin Williams, you know, in the movie Robot, see a need, fill a need. Um, I, I cannot emphasize how frustrating it is for me when so-called I hate to use the word trainer. It's such an adulterated word nowadays. But when a trainer, like you said, gives you no options, it's just very hellfire and brimstone. You're going to eat only these things and you're going to go to bed with a headache and you're going to be miserable. And when we work out, you're going to remember this for the next 12 hours because you're going to be so sore you can't squat to use the restroom. Well, what is that all about, right? If I want to be in a bad relationship, I'll go get in a bad relationship, but I'm not going to go pay to be in a bad relationship and be miserable with a headache and being yelled at. And we've talked about this on previous shows together. I've always believed, I've always been of the belief rather, and I even encourage it. I want you to feel comfortable asking why we're doing something. Because if you don't understand why we're doing it, we're all human. What's going to be the motivation to actually do it? You're just kind of going through the motions. You kind of have cooking it. Now, if you know that your your late energy, excuse me, your late race endurance is lacking probably because you don't like the boring blue aerobic workouts. You like that high intensity, hard work. Well, that's probably leading itself to why you don't have late race endurance because it requires aerobic capacity. If you're somebody who enjoys doing the long, slow distance stuff, but the idea of doing short explosive intervals is miserable to you, it probably is exemplified when you race. Probably lack that top end sprint speed, that early get out of the gate and go. Well, this is where if you and I sit down and, we, and we, you and I have already done this, if you're getting ready to go do some of Zeb's races, right? And it's, it's, it's a seven round series and it's all six lap sprints and you've got to be able to go like you stole it. Well, you've got to train to those demands. Well, wait a second, Rob, I'm not a quick twitch guy. I'm a slow diesel engine. Okay, well, let's talk about what we can do physiologically, i.e. a warm up, to make sure that you could be a little bit better at your sprint speed by tricking the body into thinking it's been out there longer. So when the gate drops, it thinks it's already been out there for 15 minutes, not using five of the six laps to get up to speed. My point is, is you need to know why you're doing it. And the why goes back to what we said earlier. Where are you at? Where do you want to go? And what's the path to get there? It's not just about giving everybody the same thing over and over and over again. And then heaven forbid, if you do ask, and then the trainer's like, what are you doubting me? No, it's just asking a question. So that's where, again, if a trainer won't explain, probably they don't understand. Like literally, if they're petrified to tell you why you're doing something, they probably don't understand it. And if they throw this out there, well, you would never get it. I, I call BS on that. I call yeah, or if total they, BS. Or if they can't answer your questions, right? Mm-hmm. If they can't address the questions that you have. Uh, like I'll, I'll give you a classic example without naming names. I was on a program when I was younger mm-hmm. and I didn't like, like I alluded to, I didn't like some of the food that was on yeah. there. And I said, Man, I'm I'm not going to eat this. I, I just I simply am just not going to eat it. So, what can I eat in its place? Mm-hmm. And he told me nothing. Yep. You got to eat that. And I'm like, so so. What do you think that made me do? Yeah, you're yeah. gone. I'm gone. Like I yep. I'm not eating that. You can't answer my question. You can't give me an alternative. You're you're basically shoving me in the same box as everybody else. That's right. And if, if you don't mind me elaborating on it, the problem that I have with that is now they've taken, and this is going to, it's going to be a business statement, but please don't take it out of context. That trainer has lost perspective as who the client is. I said, you're going to do it this way and you're going to do it that way or the highway. 
Well, unfortunately for him, he got the highway, not you, because you move on with your life. You take your checkbook and you move on. Now, I'm not, and you guys know, I'm never going to be somebody that's going to tell you what you want to hear. And and just as just as to validate my statement, just so everybody, whether you've looked at me or not, from a business standpoint, I only do my contracts with my clients, including my pros, month to month for this exact reason. Because number one, if you're not satisfied with me, or if I can't serve your needs adequately, I always want you to have an out. No long-term buy-in, no buyer's remorse. But the ball bounces both ways. To your point, Dan, if I've explained to you why I want you to do it, and you clearly comprehend why we're doing it, and then you just simply choose not to do it, well, that gives me a chance to tap out. That's cool. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I, yeah, I can show you all the success that we've had as a company. Okay, great. That doesn't mean squat to the end user. What really matters is can I take my knowledge and my experience and help you as an individual, the person that's listening to this right now? Because you're, where you're at has its own history, injuries, you know, it's, disappointment, the the, the the multitude of things that could put you into the place you're at is predicated off how long you've been on earth. Because every day it molds us to either a more positive or a negative environment. Those are sometimes hard to turn around. But if you come back full circle, when that trainer's like, you're going to do it my way or no way, that to me is very interesting because they've lost sight as to who the client is. At the end of the day, I work for you. That's it. It doesn't matter how big our company is, doesn't matter how big our bank account is, doesn't matter how many athletes we're working with. At the end of the day, I work for you. So isn't it only fair that you should be able to ask, why am I doing it? Don't I have a moral responsibility to tell you? And don't I have a, a, a professional obligation? If I don't know, I should be very honest and transparent and say, I don't know, but I will find out for you. Like for example, I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with thyroid. I have just enough. And then at certain point, I reach out to my blood doctor, Dr. Brainy, and I pay him a premium to help me with my client who has a thyroid issue. I know where my lines stop and start. Again, I'm not Mr. Superhero, and I'm, I'm just saying, I don't have a problem saying, hey, Dan, you know what? I know just enough, and I'll share what I do know, but out beyond that scope, where this guy's like, well, don't, don't challenge me. Just eat what I told you to eat. Yeah. Why should I eat? I, I say this all the time with our young kids. I need you to foam roll. Well, for anybody who's foam roll, you'd rather watch paint dry. But if I say to these young athletes, hey, look, if we can get your hamstring flexibility to be up by 2 to 3%, your chance of dabbing your foot in the corner and tearing your knee is going to go down by 100%. You can guarantee that little, that little nipper is going to be over there on a foam roller because I'm speaking his or her language in their current currency, which is they want to go fast, excuse me, through the corners. Well, tell me why a foam roller and how a foam roller is going to improve my corner speed. Yep. But see, everybody Make gets it relatable. All, well, they get very defensive. Yeah. Well, I'm the ex-pro. Don't you question me. In fact, because you screwed up that corner, get off the bike and do 25 push-ups. Yeah. Like doing 25 push-ups is going to help you understand what you did wrong in the corner. And then you get these, you get these trainers who are like, you're not into this. You're not mentally focused. And then you found out mom and dad gave them a high seat punch because they don't know better. They, they seriously gave him high seat punch because they're like, well, I know that the little guy needs to have some calories in him and he needs to some fluid. So here's Hawaiian punch. So his blood sugar goes through the roof. Then he gets an insulin splash and then he's like, or insulin crash, excuse me. And then he's like, oh, squirrel. Oh, airplane. What's going on? You know? Yeah. You see where the frustration for the parent, they're trying to do the right thing. But then if you ask, hey, what, what should I, what should my athlete eat before they show up? And you go, why would you add? I'm not a nutritionalist. That's not my problem. I'm a riding coach. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem, and that's where that's why we try to do it as a complete training solutions. Is the parents who want to go work with a riding coach, they look to us to make sure they've got stabilized blood sugar, they've got the strength, they've got the flexibility. So now when the riding coach asks them to do it, they can do it for as long as they're asked to do it. And this is why we're expanding our network of coaches because. I've tried, and man, I can't emphasize this enough. I've tried for the last 20 years to work with existing riding coaches. And with the exception of a Ronnie Tishner, I've never had a riding coach that's been so easy to work with. And what I mean by easy to work with is Ronnie Tishner never felt like I was trying to overstep my bounds with him. I always would ask a lot of questions on how Ronnie teaches so that I could try to make sure that his athletes that I was working with were 
physically capable of doing what Ronnie was asking them to do. And that would be the Ashley Filix, the Ian Treadles, the Adam C's of the world, the Zach Freebergs, uh, John John Ames. Great group of guys and, and girls, obviously. But the takeaway in all that is I've gotten tired of trying to work with riding coaches. In fact, every time I've tried to work with a riding coach, I'd say over 50% of the time, I actually got stabbed in the back. Um, I hired a riding coach to, uh, to work with a group of riders here in Florida. And the riding coach actually told a couple of the riders to fire me and go to work with him full time. And he actually got them to move their motorhomes onto his his own property. Oh, chief. That's how unscrupulous this industry has gotten to. Yeah. I love the industry, but the 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 riding coach environment is a very, very volatile environment. So here's what I'm doing. I have now reached out with riders that I've worked with over the years who kind of grew up underneath our toolage. And I've gone out and I've sought like Ben Moberg out of California. This guy has got a PhD in human movement and biokinesiology. I mean, you're talking about the brilliant of the brilliant. This guy is at, at the tip of the spear. Well, I've been fortunate enough that he's agreed to come on and now he's one of our certified complete racing solution coaches. Now think about what I'm trying to provide. Dan, you've got a young athlete. You're like, Rob, I like everything that you do. And my wheelhouse is off the bike, right? I ride a lot and I do performance camps. I'm integrating the human body, but I am not a riding coach. I'm not going to argue whether you should have one or two fingers on the front brake. That's a Ben Moberg type of a question. That's a Jamie Hunkler type of a question. Jamie Hunkler is one of our CRS coaches up in the New England area. His home track's uh, Winchester and up there by um, Southwick, right? Oh, yeah. So that whole Northeast area. So what I'm trying to do, and we're we're about at about 50% of where we want to be because I'm being very, very slow. I've, I've gone a completely different, different direction when it comes to picking riding coaches. What I'm looking for is somebody that I've had the privilege of working with who understands our ideology and they've thrived under it. I want people who have the riding coach experience. Jamie Hunkler can fly on a motorcycle. Ben Moberg can haul the mail on a dirt bike. Well, now what I'm able to do is they already understand my methodology. Now, when you bring your daughter to me or your son to me and you're like, hey, Rob, I live in SoCal. Who's your CRS riding coach in this area? Well, here's Mr. Ben Moberg. Well, where if I'm in Central Cal? What if I'm in NorCal? Here's each one of our coaches. We just put a, together a relationship with Ian Gray at Psycho Ranch, and we're working on getting him a riding coach there. I'm working, obviously, with Daniel Blair at Next Level, right? So now you go, you get the experience of Daniel Blair at Next Level. He agrees with the way that we do things. He's supporting what we do. Now, and, and literally, we're in the process of doing this right now, I have three athletes in Australia that we're going to be putting at Daniel's place. I have one athlete that's going to be coming in to Texas and working with Ian Gray and whichever riding coach we put there. And we're even going so far as to possibly take some of the riding coaches that we have in Australia and the UK and actually bring them over because you don't have all the high school drama. Because yeah. think about it. Think about a lot of our riding coaches. Oh, you're working with Dan? Oh, you? I'm not, I'm not working with you anymore. Why? Well, because you went and worked with Dan. Yeah, it's 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 a bunch of drama. It's high school. It's high yeah. school all over again. And what I always tell my parents is I say, go to every riding coach you can. If you get one nugget out of those riding coaches and then find what works for you. And that's what I love about Ben and what I love about Jamie. Over in the UK, we're fortunate enough, we have a Richard McEwen. And so we've got a performance facility out of his track at Desert Martin. When you get to Australia, very, very blessed. We work with Todd Waters. He owns the Husqvarna team over there. And we have four human performance centers that we're getting ready to launch over there where each performance center has a CRS coach. So now if you're in Australia and you're in Sydney, you can go to this location. What do you get? You get the riding coach with all the off the bike. And now what have you got? An athlete who has a complete program. So, and the last piece of the puzzle is we're um, negotiating we, we've got a, a pretty good contract that I think that we'll have in place with three of the MXGP teams. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to cultivate a relationship where we have an international development program. The first stage is they leave America and they go train with Richard McEwen and we do all the Scottish and the British rounds. They're not GP. They're not MXGPs. They're what we call British GPs. So you're going to live in a hub out of Desert Martin. You're going to live there for three months. Richard's going to take you over and do some stuff in Spain, and we're going to do little small four-month camps. 
see if you can really cut your teeth in the European market. Then once we get that established, let's say like the person we're working with right now, a lot of people may be familiar with him is Chase Dashell. He's on my factory team. He's on an 85 right now. We have on, on a four-year development plan. So what we're doing is right now we're working with Derek with HP Development. And what we're going to be doing is ultimately building Chase up to go live in Great Britain and go do the, G, the GPs over there for four months. And he's going to come home. And then if we find that he likes it, then we're going to send him over and we're, we'll work with, can't announce a team right now because we don't have a signed contract, but it's one of the OEM teams that we have in the MXGP side of things, right? So now you get to go really dip your feet in and go do lone wolf. Go over there and start doing some of these GP tracks. And now what we've done is these teams are start, starting to look to us to cultivate riders that we know can go the distance, but we give them a chance. Go over and, and see if you can do the UK is cold. UK is wet. Yeah. It's uh it's brutal. And Richard is has got a great disposition about himself. Desert Martin was actually one of the MXGP tracks on the circuit in its day. But the point is we have stepping grounds and Richard has the ability and he has a lot of contacts in the MXGP world where now Richard can help you bridge that gap into getting into some of these other contracts that we've put together. So do you see the network here? We want to have athletes and if we work with them quite well, we can put them on our development program. The development program gets them to work. And by the way, you don't even have to be on one of our teams. If you're looking for somebody that understands our ideology, we've got our coaches around the country like I said, we've got Jamie up in the Northeast. We've got Daniel Blair in North Carolina. We're negotiating with the South Carolina track right now. I don't know about that guy, man. <laughs> um, I've got I've got Ian Gray in Texas. I've got three here in Florida. And then as you move west, um, we are uh, putting something together around the Ohio, Indiana area. We thought we had something in place, but it's kind of gone sideways. So don't have much on that right now. And then when we get to California, we want Northern, Central, and South. And then we're working on a contract in Utah. So our goal is, is I, I would love it if we could kind of minimize how much time these parents have to separate themselves from their family and their children while they go live at a training facility that's 4,000 miles away, you know? Yeah. Um, and then if the child does cultivate the skills necessary, how do we bridge that gap into going into the professional ranks and I think the outdoor world is really over on the MXGP side of things. That's my biased opinion and talking with a lot of people. I mean, obviously my opinion has been here for a long time, but Jet Lawrence makes me look kind of smart because if you look at what Jet and Hunter did, that's exactly the model that we've been creating. And that was obviously started almost 20 years ago before Jet was even conceived. So the whole, the whole idea here is we know that the best way to go is sink your feet into the MXGP route and then make your way over. Zach Osborne did it. Jet, Hunter, um, Max and Steve, the list goes on. But that's always been our model. So it's kind of neat to see these guys make the concept work. But yeah. it goes back to, Dan, you've got a nine-year-old son. He's really showing he's got some raw talent. Now the parents are like, where do we go? And that was honestly the genesis behind doing the Navigating the Amateur Motocross, which is one of my new podcasts. You've probably seen that out. We've yeah. dropped episode number two. And that's ironically with Derek Harris with HP Development because he's a guy that's been part of these negotiations with these amateur teams and these pro teams. And he sees it from a motor and suspension standpoint. How do you navigate? What do you invest in? What races do you go to? Um, Dan, are you okay if I announce our new pod while we're here? Yeah. Yeah, do it. Let's go. Uh, the, uh, while we're talking about a genesis of ideas, right? Building a network of coaches and then building a network of facilities complementing that with coaching programs and supplements and products. Those products include, you know, core body temperature, uh, sweat rate analysis, all kinds of cool things. We've got some new products coming out. Well, as we build this international development program, one of the common questions we keep hearing is, well, how do we get from amateur to pro? So Derek and I kind of was, were brainstorming on it. And so now we're two episodes in, we have the Navigating Amateur Motocross. You can find it here on the Coach Rob Beams YouTube channel. Go to Coach Rob Podcast. And Dan and I are here uh, tonight to announce we are going to start a show called The Vet Show. And it's going to be geared towards all you vet riders out there. Everything you ever needed to know about how to train uh, the dreaded, you know, going from the 20s to the 30s, the 30s to the 40s, 40s to 50s, and 50s on up. 
Uh, we're going to break everything down. We're going to break down nutrition, sports psychology, injury, injury prevention, injury healing. Um, we've got an entire storyboard of almost two years of information already. And Dan and I are really biting at the bit at this. We're going to try to record and, our next and, one. And it's the reality of being a vet rider because yes, it's not all roses and sunshine all, <laughs> always, right? We we are very busy individuals as is older gentlemen or, or gals, right? We got a lot going on in life. So exactly. our program is a lot different than a 12-year-old ripper. So that's exactly it's right. going to be good. Well, and, and when you and I were brainstorming on it, I really didn't think about how it's literally the two ends of the bookcase, you know, the amateur. Yeah. And, and when we do the navigating the amateur motocross, our, our real focus is talking about like going from 85s and making it. But even with the things that we speak about on that, I think a vet rider could benefit from it, but it's more about as a parent who's confused whether you should go left or right, up or down. Um, we're, we're going into everything under the sun. Uh, we have some ex-moto parents that, um, let's just say their kids are still racing to this day, but they may not have good relationships with them because the system kind of annihilated their parent-child relationship. We're going to bring them on, not to blow the industry out, but to shed light on what they would do differently if they were doing it over... Obviously, hindsight is always twenty twenty. We've got some really powerful guests over the next year that I think are going to be good. And Dan and I have the same thing lined up on the vet side. You know, let's face it, every pro becomes a vet eventually, yep. and we're going to be talking to them and, and having them come on board. It's kind of like an integration of our meet the guests, Coach Rob uh, podcast that I do. Um, obviously, Dan and I with the vet show, and so we're just going to continue to to add into our podcast network. Again, see a need, fill a need. Same thing yeah. with supplements and everything else. We've had a lot of questions about the vets, and we're we're going to get after it very, very aggressively. Um, if you're young, you're probably going to find it boring. If you're you know over that 25, 30, you're probably going to find it very informative, and it's not just going to be all about fitness and nutrition. It's going to be everything, like you say, every aspect associated with it. So it's I'm very excited like, to announce that. I, I am too, because it's, you know, I'm 40 years old now. I could you know, I don't race a whole lot anymore, you know, I, but I love to ride. I, you know, ride every weekend, couple, you know, try to ride a couple times a week still. Yep. But my goals are different, right? I'm, I'm getting older. I want to be healthier, right? Mm -hmm. Because things change when you get in your thirties and forties, your body changes, but I want to be healthier and I want to be able to ride a motorcycle safe. Like that's, that's my main concern is to be safe. And how do we, how do we, how do we maintain being safe while still having a decent pace, right? So it, this exactly. is going to be really fun. Well, and, and there'll be times that we'll take and break it down maybe in five and 10 year increments. Hey, this show today is going to be on people between 35 and 45 or whatever. Uh, we've got a lot of different ideas. But with that being said, you know, feel free to DM or leave a message below here. Um, if you're a vet rider and there's something that you want us to dive down in, yes, we've got a storyboard. Like I said, we've got enough content for the next couple of years. But we don't want it to be a show that we're pushing on you guys. It's the same thing that we've been doing with all the Coach Rob podcasts. When you guys ask questions, we go out and we we convert it into a show because nobody wants to just listen to us talk, Dan. There's plenty of, you know, bench racing shows that yeah. are out there. I want our podcast to be, you know, again, the late Robin Williams, see a need, fill the need. And that's on this side of the equation, seeing how many emails that we get it, that seeing the number of emails that come in that are in the form of a question just shows me that there's a lot of confusion out there and we don't want to charge a dime for it. We just want to make sure that you guys get your questions answered. Um, yep. it, Derek, Derek Harris said this best with HP development. The, when we did our episode number one, I essentially just interviewed him so people could get an idea of his background. Brilliant engineer, brilliant guy all the way around. And the cut, the, the amount of DMS that came in were pretty overwhelming and the consensus was, wow, this guy really knows his stuff. And Derek said something in episode two that I thought was so profound. He goes, if you found me smart, helpful, whatever, that's awesome. Go find somebody near you that can do the same thing. Now, to me, I'm like, dude, does that not scream credibility? Yeah. Like somebody that's not like, hey, here's my number, call me. And that's how we are. I know that I can't be everywhere in the world. So that's why we're trying to get our coaches out there and the Ben Mogul the Ben Mobergs of the world and the, and the Jamie Hunklers of the world, they're very, very smart dudes, but they also have a passion to see the sport grow. They see, they have a passion for the individual to grow, which becomes an extension of us. And even like with Nathan Glab, he's our BMX pro in Australia. 
we're we're trying to do everything we can to grow his brand. It's not about the CRS brand. It's about growing these coaches, giving these parents what they need. Bless their heart. Yeah. They're already confused and spread thin enough as it is. Now we go to the other extreme with our show, the vet rider. They've kind of gone through that transition where maybe they've got some injuries that are plaguing them. And now they're not so tight on money and they've got the ability to travel. How do you travel, not get sick? How how should you reconfigure the way you approach racing? We got a lot of fun stuff to talk about, yep. but hopefully this provides Dan between episode one and two, you know, who I am and what we've, what I've tried to do with, with my own experiences and then being blessed enough to be out there and hearing a lot of questions and, you know, I'll say for the third and final time, seeing a need and filling a need. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that we can continue to offer that. We do have some new products and services. Like I said, the one that you guys will see coming out in April is our sweat analysis patch. Um, it's very, very simple device to use, relatively inexpensive, and it allows me to actually look at your profile of sweat and how we can actually change our energy fuel for you, the end user, literally, if you That's need awesome. a little bit more of sodium or potassium or whatever. So it's something that we really are proud of, something we've been working on for a long time. Behind that, we've got the core body temperature device. Uh, we've got some um, continuous glucose monitoring devices. Um, we've got... Uh, I'll just stop with that because I don't want people to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. But these are just resources that once you gather the data, it's like people who, who bike using power, they spend all the money on the power meters, but don't know how to interpret the data. That's what we want to be a resource for. If you're going to invest in these resources, I want to get them for you at the best price and then show you how to, any, how to use them and integrate them on a daily basis and then how to interpret the data so you can really leverage your investment, whether it's your watch or your CGM or your or your sweat patch. So- a lot Love. of cool things coming down the line. We have we have two minutes left. Yes, sir. Uh, but I have two questions left. So you have okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Answer each one of these questions. You got it. First one is, what is the worst part of being a coach and the worst part of your job? The worst part, that's a tough one, man. Worst part would be, and I'll stick to moto for a moment, is the moto parents that jump at the flavor of the month. You know, if I've had an athlete that I've had for four or five years and I've shown you incremental improvement and you've seen the process of the system and then somebody offers you a false promise and then you bail, because you got to remember, and I, I know this is going to sound sappy, but I put as much energy into every one of my clients as if you were my own child. And when someone just on a whim jumps, it's kind of like if, you, if you're a Scott Goggle rep and somebody bails for $5 more and you're like, I've supported you for 15 years and you bail for $5 more, that's what it feels like. Um, that's the worst part about it. I would, uh, off the top of my head, I'd say that's the worst part is you've proven what you do works, but they want to jump to a flavor of a month or a false promise. And I don't say this in a boastful way, but 99% of the times it backfires and they end up losing. So it's a sad thing to sit and watch materialize. My last question, what is the best part and the most rewarding part of what you do? Uh, Best part of my job is I get to sleep in every day without an alarm. <laughs> I've worked uh, 25 years. Oh, stop. Your you're you're alarm is internal. I know. <laughs> I, I do wake up with the sun, but it is nice going to bed every night without that mental angst. I would say that's the best part. Um, the, second, yeah, I, the second part is what we said earlier. When you get those random emails, text messages, DMs, it says, I heard you here, or I followed your program here. And you changed my life. Uh, you turned things around. Even, Dan, the first one that we did, I received th I, three specific, I can remember off the top of my head, where guys have actually decided to um, change their careers. Um, and Choose Your Hard was another one that uh, a guy was kind enough. He said, I'm I'm going and I'm doing things differently. Uh, we talked about, That's like, awesome. if I had my heart attack, if you only had, if you yeah. knew you were limited on time. Um, I've got a couple of guys that are looking at a career change, and they said it was because of that that show. Those would be the intangibles that makes getting out of bed every every morning that much easier. Um, you know, just trying to improve somebody's life. I I had a facility here out actually, ironically, by James Stewart's place for oh, it's about six years. And we had a young man that was working with us, Jeff Toady, and he went on to become an Army Ranger, or excuse me, a Navy SEAL, excuse me. And wow. one of the finest compliments I ever got was he said, the discipline you taught me made that a, a, a doable job. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I haven't seen that young man for eight or 10 years. And now all of a sudden he's a Navy SEAL, one of the baddest, you know, anybody who serves in the military, I'm sincerely on behalf of Dan and I, thank you, yes. your family. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. 
um, when you're dealing with people that are willing to go out and, I mean, there's, I don't know, anybody that's willing to serve the country. And then when you take that kind of intelligence and you, you choose to continue to serve our country when there's other things that you can do for probably less money. And unfortunately, not you're not getting the respect that I feel you deserve either as a country or as a leader. Um, but yeah, I would say that those are the ones that come back. Um, one person that I want to say in particular, Spencer Daly, um, he's been one of the nicest. I, I'll get a random text message and he'll say, I just want you to know I'm out here working on my tractor. Um, and I was just thinking how appreciative I am of you. I haven't worked with Spencer Daly in 15 years. He was actually Brian Dungy's best man at his wedding. Um, he's the reason why I got Dunge, as I mentioned in episode number one. Besides what we did together as athletes, coach, client, and all that, he just randomly will say, hey, man, I just want you to know, you, 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 I still feel you in my life today. Um, and those are the ones that I think are worth more than any money could ever be printed. So I'm forever grateful. Coach Rob, thank you. Thank you to all of our listeners, all of our subscribers on YouTube. Make sure, guys, that you like and share. Uh, make sure you guys uh, leave the comments below. Like Coach said, we love to read them. Um, Coach, you have you have changed my life. I love you like a brother. Appreciate and, it. And um, we will see you all in the next one. You guys be safe. Peace.